Well, good morning. Trust everybody's had their breakfast and their coffee. You're good to go. Um, my name, uh, as Alan said, is Pavan Rajgopal. Paul. I work for Geo Control Systems. It's a small company that uh, does a lot of work with NASA JSC and then also at the White Sands Test Facility. Uh, I'm the lead for a team that's currently performing independent verification and validation <coughs> on, the, on the NASA Commercial Crew Program. And today I'm going to talk about some methods and approaches that we have been using to perform risk-driven IVMV on spacecraft flight software. So here's a, an overview of the presentation. Uh, we'll start by talking about the objectives that led us to use the particular approaches and methods that we're going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, for those who are not familiar with IVNV, and I suspect there are probably some here who are not, I'll provide a brief overview of that. I'll discuss strategies for targeting and scoping uh, IVNV. Uh, I'm going to talk about the use of assurance cases as a framework for IVNV analysis, and also how that framework can be used to evaluate and monitor the risk associated with spacecraft systems and software as that risk changes over time. And then I'm going to finish up with some benefits that we've observed from using these methods and talk about where we would like to take these methodologies and approaches in the future. So historically, we understand that spacecraft flight software is prone to defects. Uh, the application of IVNV um, has been effective in identifying and resolving those defects. Um, our team, uh, had three main objectives for developing and evolving the methodologies and approaches that I'm going to discuss. Uh, first, since we had very limited resources, we wanted to accurately scope and target our IVNV effort. Second, we wanted to effectively perform IVNV to identify and resolve defects in the flight software that we were looking at. And then third, we wanted to actually measure and communicate the risk reduction that was achieved through the apl application of IVNV. So I'll start off with a quick background of IVNV. Um, independent verification validation is a systems engineering discipline. Its objective is to ensure that systems and software are correct and complete. There's a lot of other illities that we look at as well, but that's kind of an, uh, a high level view. Uh, the IVNV team is technically, organizationally, and financially independent of the development team. That's the independence part. Uh, the development team typically is focused on what is required to make the system and space and, and the software succeed. IVNV in general tends to focus on what can cause the system to fail. That's the difference in perspective. Now, IVNV is most effective when it's applied through the entire system and software development lifecycle, but it can be of benefit at any point in the system and software development. In terms of information sources, IVNV uses developer supplied artifacts, but it also leverages the domain knowledge of IVNV analysts who tend to be subject matter experts in spacecraft systems and software. So I mentioned IVNV activity includes analyzing developer supplied technical artifacts. IVNV also ass assesses the adequacy of verification activities and environments. And uh, we also perform independent testing not to duplicate or replicate the developer's effort, but primarily to validate concerns that are raised through IVNV analysis. So I mentioned we understand from history that flight software is prone to defects. The software development lifecycle is intended to flush out those defects as early as possible so that they don't leak through into later phases of software development, uh, particularly the, the operational phase. The defects discovered late in the development cycle require more effort and cost to fix. So financially speaking, there's definitely a benefit in identifying and fixing those defects as early as possible. Now given the vast scope and breadth of potential activities for IVNV, it's really necessary to prioritize those activities to ensure maximum return on investment. The ratio of the development workforce, the IVNV workforce can sometimes be as much as 50 to 1. 
And so there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, so a number of schemes or approaches have been developed to achieve this prioritization. There's two that we're aware of. Uh, the first is something called criticality analysis and risk assessment. It was pioneered by L3 Communications in the early 1990s. Um, another approach called portfolio-based risk assessment, or PBRA, was developed, and I believe it's still being used by the NASA ivn facility. Now these traditional scoping strategies are very helpful, but they're often not precise indicators of where exactly to look for defects in flight software or systems and software. Now our team has found critical events to be a very effective basis for targeting the IV and the activity. Uh, the approach is based on a flow of mission events and it's particularly suitable for spacecraft systems and software. Typically, spacecraft systems and flight software development begins with mission timelines and concept of operations and critical events can be readily identified from this initial information. Now using critical events allows IVNV to start at the earliest phases of software development. And that IVNV analysis can be progressively evolved and elaborated as the program proceeds through the software development life cycle and as more artifacts become available and as those artifacts mature. Those new and more mature, hopefully more mature artifacts can be used to resolve risks that are identified during the early phases of IVNV activity. Using critical events enables, also enables narrowing of analysis targets and prioritization and focus of IVNV scope. It also tends to drive analysis that cr cuts across multiple subsystems since in, in those, these kinds of systems, hardware and software have to work together in an integrated fashion to successfully perform those critical events. So critical event identification. Critical events are identified using risk consequence. Each significant mission event is scored based on the consequence of risk of, of the event failure. Now scoring categories include things like human safety, loss of mission, loss or damage to assets, and loss of key mission objectives. The risk consequence in various categories is blended into a composite consequence score and that score is used to rank mission events and identify the ones that we consider to be the most critical. Those critical events become candidates for IV and V analysis, and the events that have a greater composite score get the greater priority in analysis. So analysis of each critical event uses a fairly well-known concept of assurance cases. An assurance case is a structured argument based on safety cases. It uses a logical decomposition from a high level claim to supporting claims and eventually down to evidence. That high level claim is typically successful performance of a system function or a mission objective. The supporting claims underneath that high level claim may be related to things like system configuration, uh, the environment, procedures, software or hardware functionality. There may be multiple levels of supporting claims based on things like the complexity of the event or the number of systems and subsystems that are involved, involved in accomplishing that event. The lowest level of the assurance case is the evidence that validates or invalidates the supporting claims. Now, examples of evidence would include things like documentation, testing, and analyses. So our team has used this assurance case concept to drive the analysis of critical events. We begin by constructing a risk tree for a given critical event using the structure of the assurance case. The top level claim in our case is the risk of critical event failure. The supporting events, supporting claims, are the supporting claims or uh, that risks that contribute to that top level risk. The completeness and correctness of the evidence determines the risk likelihood for those lowest level supporting nodes or supporting claims. Uh, absence of evidence means that there is greater risk. Uh, errors or omissions in the artifacts or evidence, things like missing requirements, insufficient verification, also increase the risk. That risk tree is progressively elaborated 
as IBMD participates in each phase of the life cycle, as the developer artifacts mature, and as IBMD's knowledge and understanding of the system increase. Those errors and omissions are, that are discovered are documented as issues and provided to the developer for resolution. Now typically issues are a main output of IBMD. Once the risk tree is developed, the next step is to evaluate the risk likelihood. Same slide. The, uh, that's okay. The next step is to evaluate the risk likelihood of that top level claim, which in our case is failure of a critical event. Risk likelihood scoring can be performed adjectivally, we'll see examples of this, numerically or probabilistically, and it can be tailored to the risk approach that is currently used on the development program. Now in terms of scoring, the absolute likelihood score, risk likelihood score is useful, but it's not the most important indicator. The change in that score over time is actually more significant. Now there's an ex expectation that as IVMV reviews evidence and assesses it, the risk likelihood of the supporting claims, the low level claims, should decrease. And that risk is rolled up through the risk tree structure to decrease the risk likelihood of that top level claim. And the change in scoring that occurs as we go through the software development lifecycle uh, reflects the benefit or return on investment that is achieved through the application of IVMV to the software development project. So here are some examples of, the, of top level claims. These are, are common risks for both manned and unmanned spacecraft. So here we have some examples of supporting claims. We have used these subclaims in constructing the risk trees for our critical event analysis and we found them to be very useful in uncovering risk. So here are some examples of evidence uh, that's used to evaluate and hopefully to reduce the risk likelihood of the supporting claims and hence the, the top level claim. So here's an example of a portion of a risk tree for a spacecraft flight software at the design phase. Um, it's a fairly simple example. Uh, risk trees can be a lot more uh, many more levels and much more complicated, but it illustrates essentially how a top level risk claim, in this case failure of a deorbit burn, can be decomposed into multiple levels of supporting subclaims and that decomposition continues until either further decomposition is not possible or feasible or you get to a point where you can evaluate the risk likelihood based on evidence, documentation or testing. Now, of course, before you can develop this kind of a detailed risk tree and do this decomposition, you need to have a fairly good understanding of the architecture and functionality of the system. That understanding will take time, but once that understanding is achieved, this risk tree provides a useful way of documenting it. So this chart here depicts an alternate format for constructing the risk tree that uses an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this particular format depicts an adjectival scoring approach. Now we found that using this kind of format makes it easy to roll up the score from evidence to supporting claims to top level claims. Uh, L3 Communications has developed a quantitative risk likelihood scoring approach that's based on dempster schaefer belief functions and the results of an IVNV return on investment study that was performed a number of years ago for the NASA IVNV facility. That return on investment study considered historical defect data from multiple spacecraft software development programs and measured the reduction in defects that was achieved through the application of IVNV. That historical defect data is also correlated to project characteristics and both project and IVNV activities. Uh, the scoring method that L3 came up with computes the belief that the top level claims will be realized based on the associated evidence and the relative importance of, uh, of related subclaims. So here's an example 
of probabilistic scoring using the Excel spreadsheet-based format for risk reconstruction. So analysis and scoring. So risk likelihood scoring uh, for a critical event analysis is performed from the bottom up once you've constructed the risk tree. Analysis is focused at the lowest level subclaims, and the risk is evaluated based on the associated evidence. Now an IBMB analyst reviews the evidence and makes an assessment of how well it addresses uh, or doesn't address the, and resolves the associated risk claim. The analyst relies on his or her domain expertise and knowledge of the system to make that assessment. Now once the risk likelihood for the lowest level supporting subclaims uh, are, ident are, are assessed, the tree structure and the, the relationships between claims and supporting subclaims are used to roll up the scores and establish the risk likelihood of the top level claim. So our team has observed a number of benefits uh, from the approaches and methodologies that we've discussed. Um, using critical events, I mentioned already, drives a cross-cutting IVMV analysis across multiple subsystems that have to work together to accomplish a critical event. Uh, the risk tree methodology provides very useful insight. As we decompose a risk from the top level claim to the lowest level subclaims, it identifies the evidence that's required to validate the supporting claims and risk reduce risk likelihood. So IVNV has, has an idea of what exactly they're looking for in terms of evidence. Now sometimes that evidence is not yet available, especially if we're in the early phases of the software development life cycle. However, whatever analysis is done during the early phases uh, allows IVNV to know exactly what to look for in the later phases. And if it's not there, then that impacts risk. Uh, the event analysis itself also points out errors and omissions that, that have to be resolved and we submit those as issues to the developer. Now although the approach still relies on the subjective judgment of the analyst to evaluate the evidence at the lowest level, it does provide a more objective and defensible basis for characterizing the risk likelihood of those top level claims, which in our case are critical event failures. So in conclusion, um, our team has found that, critical of, that a critical event risk-driven approach is effective for scoping and executing IVNV. It permits fine-grained targeting of IVNV and analysis activity into the areas that have the highest potential for risk reduction. It also provides a reliable and objective basis for scoping, prioritization, and analysis decisions. And then also the risk tree, which is a useful artifact developed during risk decomposition, serves as a permanent record of the understanding that IVMV has gained from having analyzed the system. And it also provides a record of IVMV analysis outcomes and then later on during later uh, phases it facilitates change impact analysis as the system and software evolve. So we, we've been thinking about some future work that we would like to do to enhance these methodologies. Um, first, we would like to enhance the scoring approaches by tracking observed defects against the risk assessment that we've performed. As the project unfolds, we can compare the defect trajectory that we expected with the one we actually found, and this would allow us to, to refine the decomposition and risk scoring techniques. Uh, we're also thinking about integrating some of these methodologies into an automated project management tool set that we can use to facilitate IVMV task identification and prioritization. And then finally, we'd like to look at approaches for automating the tracking and reporting of risk scoring for events. So here's some references. Questions? Yes. Wait. Oh. The mic. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Um, a couple of quick ones. One is, I, I get from the conclusions then that the tool set you're using essentially Excel with the methodology wrapped around it. Is that correct? Or do you have some? Okay, so it's an Excel based. Um, I have a lot of questions. Maybe I'll talk to you offline. But one would be, you know, we start when you start with the claims and the subclaims, um, the, the, the difficulty you can fall into is 
how valid are they? So in other words, you want to be chasing down valid uh, valid risks to a vehicle so that you are driving the design for things that are the most realistic. Yes. Right? Because oftentimes we can get wrapped around the axle and we can even optimize a design for, for instance, for a risk or a potential failure right. that really isn't valid. And so you end up with it non-optimized for all the more realistic conditions that you have to handle for a critical event. So do you have any methodology for for validating claims once you once you postulate them. Um, so the the what we rely on up at the, up until this point is the folks that are looking at those critical events have looked at several spacecraft programs. So at this point, whether we have a methodology or or an approach that we can use, no. The folks that are looking at it have looked at several spacecraft software development programs, and they know that you know, when it comes to a particular type of critical event, that these are the things that you have to watch out for. Um, so, yeah, the answer would be at this point, we don't have a, a methodology. We rely on the, the experience of, of uh, IV and D analysts. Okay, got it. That's, yeah, I, what I would consider common, I guess, is ultimately relying on experts yes. to, to do a good job there. Yeah, and to a large extent, I mean, for, I, for IV and V to be eff effective, the folks uh, who are looking at the system really have to understand those kinds of systems or have an expertise in the domain. Right. It's just ultimately then you end up evaluating it from the perspective of, um, I want this system to, by design, handle any possible postulated condition, right. which, which makes it very solid and an easier story to sell, but doesn't make it very efficient, especially as we get into smaller, more agile systems. So it's just something maybe to think about. Yeah, we have to take a look at that. You're right. is more aimed at the audience than at the presenter. Um, I've been working a lot with fault management and IVMV facilities, and IVMV is stretched to their limit normally to cover all the things that they need to do. And we've been capturing this information, as you mentioned, in a spreadsheet format. Has, has, is there any need or has anybody looked into some low-level tool that allows the developer or designer to start capturing this stuff as something they can feed up to the higher organizations? It's pretty much ad hoc now, and I'm just thinking, sh shouldn't we develop something at some low level that we can feed up and meet their paradigm and things like that? And I just haven't seen it. Can I, can I respond to that? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Actually, uh, so uh, J JPL is using um, Magic Draw and other uh, UML-based uh, representations of functional decompositions. Um, which then can um, each have uh, an associated risk, um, and so so th those products do exist. You can generate fault trees and things like that from from these. Yeah, I, would, I was at the, the fault management, or the I guess it was the MBSC presentations when they were actually developing uh, fault trees and everything out of a magic draw model, and uh, it was quite impressive. I'm just not sure we're all up to that level. But we certainly should have something above Excel spreadsheets. Um, so the the question that I had was, um, how do you handle uh, f the potential for functional or representing functional redundancy or uh, required uh, concurrent behavior? So if you have two functions that need to be simultaneous, right? Are, do you just roll that up into an amalgam number, or do you actually decompose that? So what we're doing here is not necessarily doing a functional decomposition. But each each function will have associated risks, and if there are multiple ways to perform it, then you, you need how do you decompose that risk to the, the separate possible functions? We use the risk tree for is to drive you know what we look for. I mean the the approach that we use is not necessarily drive a, a, a particular functional decomposition or or it can adapt to whatever functional decomposition that the developer has used, right? So our concern is not necessarily that we want to drive a particular sol solution, but that we want to make sure that the developer has thought about how to solve the problem and has, has uh, at, at the early phases anyway, at the specification phases, that they've thought about how they want to develop the system and that they, they have um, specified it initially and then subsequently that they develop it correctly. 
So that kind of information that you're talking about, you know, d d two different ways of accomplishing a function, probably wouldn't show up in the, in the risk tree. What you would see is, we need this kind of capability. We need to be able to do this. Have they thought about this? Is there evidence to indicate that they have specified how they want this to be performed? And then later on, when they actually, you know, uh, when they actually implement it, is it actually implemented the way that they specified it? So I mean, typically, IBMV does not try in any way to influence uh, how they do their specification or their development activity. Uh, what we want to see is that they have thought about it and, and that they have reasonable solutions. Does that make sense? Sure. OK, other questions? OK, so I've, I've been through IBM V twice with instrument software. OK. And, and it was, a, it was a, a fine experience. But what I see working on proposals uh, and just talking to people, for a lot of the projects, for a lot of the smaller projects especially, people are relieved if they get excused from INV because they say that it's too expensive. Okay. And with CubeSats and those things coming up, I'm wondering how you would market yourself or what you see as the role of IV and V in missions that are very cost constrained. Okay, so I think I can give you a good answer to that. I mean, the situation that we are is that we don't work directly for the IVNV facility. The, uh, the developer on this program hired us initially because they're they required to provide IVNV, but they have specified a budget. And so one of the other drivers for this approach that I didn't kind of mention is that we knew that we had a certain amount of budget and we wanted to be able to achieve the maximum amount of risk reduction. So in terms of, of marketing, this is a great marketing tool because we can show that what we have, and they, they really love this approach, and that's really why they hired us, is because we could show them that with whatever amount of, of funds they can make available to us, we're going to give them the best bang for the buck in terms of focusing on the things that have the highest payback in terms of uh, preventing loss of, of life, loss of mission. Okay, thank you. Very good. Other questions? Yeah, one thing from the, uh, I work for NASA IVV, and one thing I wanted to mention was uh, looking at the CubeSat realm, the thing I've seen is basically you, know, you have a certain set of risks associated with even a CubeSat mission. Uh, those risks are generally documented in proposals, and, and, and the, uh, the PIs are usually generally aware of those. A lot of times, the independent organization can take a look at those risks um, and provide uh, either a set of resources to independently do simulation or some means to um, exhaust those behaviors. So uh, that's one way we're looking at it right now is can we actually test um, critical things or events that we see uh, based on what uh, the mission requires. <coughs> And to add to that CubeSat era, uh, the International Space Station, I believe it was about a year ago, had a problem with launching CubeSats, where the launcher was randomly launching a CubeSat out, out into space when they weren't expecting it. And we had approaching vehicles at the time, and this was acting as a very slow momentum cannon. And the problem was, in order, they couldn't safe it because everywhere they pointed the thing, it was pointing at the ISS structure. So they were hoping they could get it turned around and brought back inside that Japanese launcher. Um, so, so you wouldn't expect CubeSats to have loss of mission, loss of crew risk. And in this case, it was quite scary for a while until we got it back, back inside because you literally had to swing it around and point it at the space station before you could bring it back in to do maintenance. Thank you for sharing that horror story. <laughs> Are there other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you.